will be lecture number 42 on our ongoing uh, series on mechanical measurements. We are going to look at a new topic in this and uh, forthcoming lecture that is the introduction to measurement of gas composition. There are many situations which occur in the mechanical engineering practice. We require to know the composition of gases as for example, shown here flue gas monitoring. So, if a combustion device is operated, the flue gases are generated in the combustion process and the health of the combustion system is determined by the composition of the flue gas. If the flue gas contains too much of one or the other component like for example, if carbon monoxide is present in large quantity, then it means that the combustion is not taking place efficiently or it is not complete combustion. So, we would like to monitor the carbon monoxide uh, concentration and find out whether the combustion system is functioning properly or not. The next uh, example I can take is the case of atmospheric pollution. Nowadays, the atmospheric pollution has become a very major concern because of uh, the increasing number of vehicles and also increasing population. There are un un uh, unsuitable or things which are not required are present in large quantities in the atmosphere and we would like to find out whether these are within the safe limits or not. So, atmospheric pollution monitoring is one of the most important uh, things which we uh, are going to be meeting with in re re normal day to day uh, practice. Then uh, there are the case of exhaust gas analysis in IC engines because IC engines are a major producers of these pollutants which ultimately end up in the atmosphere, we would like to find out whether the engine is working properly. So, that the exhaust gas does not contain the pollutants in levels which are unsuitable for uh, a use. So, basically the as you can see the three, three examples I have taken are basically because of two the main reason is that there is a combustion devices which use combustion and combustion uh, devices are used in production of energy like in uh, power stations and so on. So, the flue gas monitoring becomes an important activity there and uh, usually it is done in the stack. Stack is the chimney which through which the gases are going to be let out to the atmosphere and that is where you are going to sample the flue gas. For, uh, for the second case atmospheric pollution monitoring it is present all over the atmosphere in the uh, along with the air and uh, we will have to find out how much is the concentration of atmospheric pollutants and this has this cannot be done by actually taking an instrument all over the place in the atmosphere and uh, making the measurement. One may have to go for a, a remote uh, sensing method for this particular activity. Uh, in the case of exhaust gas analysis in IC engines, it is possible to do it right near the engine as it is running. For example, it can be done when the engine is running at the, the for example, the vehicle may be moving or it may be done on a test bed. And uh, uh, many of you are uh, aware of the exhaust gas analysis being done uh, which is required by law and uh, you take the car to the uh, pollution monitoring center and actually he will uh, sample the exhaust gas coming from the uh, tail pipe and make an analysis and tell you whether it is within the limits or not. So, this is to just to have an idea about what are the circumstances in which we are going to make the measurements. So, the next uh, thing I want to look at this uh, uh, briefly and then I will come back to some of these issues a little later. So, what are the types of gas analyzers? We are going to look at the types of gas analyzers which are used and uh, broadly we can categorize them into two kinds. One is called separation and the other is called the non-separation technique. Separation technique is where 
if you have for example, a mixture of gases, you would like to separate the gases before finding out how much is the concentration of each one of them. So, that means, before the measurement a separation of the species is going to take place. In the non separation technique, it is not necessary to separate them out. The entire gas mixture is sampled and the constituents are measured in the mixed state, when they are in the mixed state. So, the separation and non-separation techniques are two main categories. Let us look at the two methods, the non-separation and the separation methods and look at what are the possible uh, instruments or measurement techniques which are available to us. One is called the non-dispersive infrared analyzer. Of course, we are going to look at it more in greater detail as we go along. It is also referred to as the NDIR, it is a very popular method. The basis for this method is of course, the using the infrared radiation and its interaction with the gas molecules. So, if you want to measure the presence or absence of the gas or the amount of gas which is present, you will have to make the infrared and uh, infrared light pass through the, the medium, where you expect the gas to be present and uh, based on the measurement, you will be able to say how much is the concentration of the particular species in question. We will uh, come back to this in a greater detail later. The second uh, technique I am going to uh, I can put under the non separation technique or non separation method is where you have differential absorption later, leaders transfer light detection and ranging. The differential absorption leader is also referred to as DIAL for short differential absorption leader. The method is uh, one which uses remote sensing that means that the, the measuring uh, instrument is at some location which is not going to change or it may be on board an aircraft for example, and the aircraft is moving and as the aircraft is moving, it is going to measure the presence or absence of the gas or the amount of gas which is present a particular gas of interest to us by using what is called differential absorption. So, this is the remote sensing of application whereas, the non dispersive infrared analyzer is usually a stationary one. The third one I am going to look at is chemiluminescence or which is used for detection of uh, nitrous uh, nitric nitrogen oxides. The nitrogen oxides are uh, usually termed as NOx. NOx stands for all oxides of nitrogen which may be present in the particular sample of gas. For example, it may be nitric oxide NO, nitrous oxide N2O, nitrogen dioxide NO2 and so on and so forth. So, it is usually it is clubbed together in NOx uh, in this uh, term NOx and the detection of NOx is very important because the very highly polluting species which is basically present because of combustion devices. Essentially for example, the IC engines, gas turbines and so on, they are the producers or the ones which give rise to the presence of NOx in the atmosphere. The second category of methods, the separation methods, I am going to take, case, take a look at only two methods, the gas chromatography which is very useful and which is very popular and which is a easily available nowadays. Uh, in the gas chromatography of course, we will uh, see later the species are going to be separated by a certain technique called the chromatographic technique and the gases which are present in the form of a mixture are separated into its constituents and uh, these uh, constituents come out of the instruments or come out of the chromatograph column which we will look at later uh, as a in time. The the species will come one after the other and we can uh, that means, that they are separated in time and then we can look at each one of them by various uh, techniques detection techniques I will describe it later. The Arcet gas analyzer is a destructive method in the, in the sense that the gas sample is collected and it is absorbed in absorbing uh, media and then the change in volume is noted and the analysis is done by chemical separation or chemical absorption method. So, what I am planning to do in this lecture and possibly in the next one is to look at these different methods of measurement and look at the basic principles and also talk about how they are useful and what we can do about them. So, let us look at the typical combustion products. Most of the time we buy we burn hydrocarbons fuel is hydrocarbon which contains hydrogen carbon and uh, possibly some other uh, 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 some other things also like for example, some sulfur may be there and uh, so on and so forth. 
but uh, we, we essentially combustion is of hydrocarbons hydrogen and carbon are the most important parts and the measurement the combustion is done in air air contains contains nitrogen and oxygen nitrogen is the nitrogen is coming into the combustion uh, pro product through the air which is used for combustion and uh, if this if the temperature is suitable nitrogen will combine with oxygen either in the in the fuel or in the oxygen which is already present in the air at high temperature they will form some compounds for example oxides of nitrogen like no nitric oxide n2o nitrous oxide no2 nitrogen dioxide etc they will all form and they are collectively referred to as nox in the combustion part we also will see the most important of course is carbon dioxide that's what we would like to have and probably water vapor because hydrogen is there in the fuel you expect a water to be formed and the water will be the form of steam at high temperature and if the temp if the if the combustion products are cooled of course it will condense and the water will become liquid water so you essentially expect oxides of carbon carbon monoxide if the combustion is not complete incomplete combustion will be indicated by presence of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide of course is the product of combustion which will form when the carbon is completely converted to ox when completely burnt and converted to oxide and then oxides of nitrogen if the temperatures are uh, proper suitable they this will these species will be formed at a high temperatures nitrogen oxide etc will form and then of course unburnt fuel the hydrocarbon which we use as a fuel itself will be present in some quantity because some fuel may not burn at all so the unburnt fuel can also be there for example when i talk about combustion product i can talk about combustion of various types of fuels it can be solid fuel or liquid fuel or gaseous fuel so depending on the type of fuel i am going to use i may have all these which are uh, uh, mentioned here or some of these may not be there it depends on the particular fuel and of course there may be particle matter or soot which is actually carbon in the form of particles it is not completely burnt the carbon is available in the form of particles and uh, the presence of particular matter in the form of soot is indicated by the dark uh, the color of the uh, fuel of the uh, the flame itself so that will indicate whether soot is there or not so basically what uh, what we are talking about is the connection between the presence of the gases in the atmosphere presence of the gases in the laboratory because of combustion as one of the sources this is only one of the sources we can think of there are other sources as i said even humans give rise to a lot of uh, in animal animals also give rise to a lot of uh, gases which are going to be present in the atmosphere after all we breathe oxygen and then give out carbon dioxide it's also known to everybody therefore carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere is because of the living beings including humans and the animals and of course animals also give rise to other gases which are present in the form of methane and so on and so forth even uh, vegetation when it rots or when it uh, uh, you know when it undergoes slow reaction in the atmosphere degradation it gives rise to a lot of these gases so the idea is that we would like to monitor or find out what is the, quali the what is the amount of these products which are present in the atmosphere and we would like to look at the various methods which we can use for doing so for example we can uh, see the emission limits which are uh, given in this table this is required by law these are all uh, uh, the the law which is present presently followed in the in india so we have the uh, the bharat standard 1 then the bharat standard 2 3 and so on these are the standards which are be to be followed by vehicle manufacturers in the design of their vehicle for example if i take a carbon monoxide this is present in the exhaust gas the limits are uh, specified here in grams per kilometer so if you run the car or the engine for 1 kilometer under specified conditions the amount of uh, uh, carbon monoxide it can uh, emit is limited by these numbers 2.72 and 3.16 and if you look at here the values here lower values are fire type approval that means that the at the stage of the approval of the vehicle and the higher values for conformity for production at the production time it, this can be slightly higher that's what it means so 2.72 3.16 you see that the amount of uh, emission in grams per kilometer is limited to 2.72 and if you look at the different standards which are uh, being uh, mentioned here this these values are actually coming down these were the standards available or uh, 
specified earlier and now it has come down to 2.2 in the case of B S 2 and in B S 3 it is going to be uh, more or less the same, but B S 4 it is going to be brought down to a level equal to 1.00. Now, uh, one may want to know what this grams per kilometer will stand for. So, grams per kilometer is measured under specified conditions if e either it can be done by actually running the vehicle and making the measurement or it could be done by running it on a test bed with a with the power being produced using which can be monitored by using a dynamometer and then you find out what is the amount of carbon monoxide which is specific specified amount you measure it over a period of time and then relate it to the grams per kilometer. The second thing is hydrocarbon this is the fuel itself petrol or diesel or whatever it is plus the NOx. The NOx is produced during the product during the combustion process. Again it is given in grams per kilometer and you can see that the values are coming down steadily and in the B S 1 and B S 2 H 3 plus NOx were clubbed together and we had 0.97 and then it has come down to 0.5, but in the B S 3 and B S 4 H C and NOx are now separately specified. So, hydrocarbon should not be present more than 0.2 grams per kilometer and uh, NOx NOx is all the nitrogen oxide less than 0.15 grams per kilometer that is what is uh, specified by this. So, you see that the emission limits are specified by law and in order to meet with these uh, limits we have to design the vehicles properly or the combustion device properly and in order to monitor we need measurement techniques. So, that is how we are building up a case for the need for measuring the gas composition. So, let us look at various ways of representing the gas concentration. So, I will come back to this slide after we I go through a little bit of background. So, I am going to look at the various ways of specifying gas concentration. So, as you very well can see there are broadly two ways of specifying it one on volume basis and the second one on mass basis. Okay, volume basis and the mass basis. So, let us look at this for example, volume basis I can specify it as so many so much of a particular gas of interest to us for example, I can put it the following way. So, volume basis is the volume of a particular species divided by the total volume. So, I am actually talking of a gas mixture because seldom are we going to get a condition where the gas is going to be present independently and separately. So, we have a mixture of gases and in that particular gas mixture I would like to find out what is the fraction of the volume occupied by the particular gas. So, basically the idea comes from uh, Dalton's law of uh, law which is very familiar to us from thermodynamics we have two ways of looking at the gas concentration either the partial volume or the volume occupied by a, by a particular species in the entire volume or we can look at it as a partial pressure we can pressure basis also it is possible of course these two are interconvertible and uh, gen generally the volume basis is what is normally used in practice and it is also represented in a slightly different way we want to represent it in the following form ppm volume basis means parts per million this will mean that this will be volume fraction so i'm going to just divide by 10 to the power of 6 the reason why i'm going to take it in the ppm uh, in this particular form is because when we are talking about the presence of gases in the atmosphere or in uh, exhaust gases and so on the amount is very small the amount of the 
gas which we are, which I am talking about for example, carbon monoxide. The amount of carbon monoxide which is present in the atmosphere is so small that it is, it is very it, it is better to divide by this by 10 to the power of 6 so that you get in terms of parts per million. So, parts per million will be a whole number that is the whole point. So, for example, 1 ppm volume basis it is also like 0 0.0001 percent by volume. So, when you are talking about very small quantities, it is better to use a unit which is of the appropriate size and therefore, I am going to use one part per million as a possible use. You saw that pop up you know. Ah. So, one per ppm is also 0 0.0001 percent by volume and uh, the reason why we are using this unit is because we are talking about very small quantities it is better to talk about you use a unit which is also appropriate. So, that the number will be a whole number instead of being a very small fraction. So, another way of uh, if the volume fraction is much smaller than even 1 ppm we can even have 1 parts per billion which is represented as 1 ppv or even smaller. So, it could be 1 parts per trillion and so on and so forth and the important fact point to note is that such levels are measurable with the modern measurement techniques it is possible to measure such small quantities of uh, volume fraction of gases present in a large volume of gas. The second point I would like to mention here is that the volume fraction is the same as the mole fraction. So, mole fraction or on the basis of mole is the same as is identical with volume fraction. Now, let us look at how we are going to convert this to the mass basis. So, mass basis. So, this is the second way of representing the presence of a particular gas species and we would like to find out how to represent. In a principle, if I am going to, going to use SI units, this will be simply given by kilograms per cubic meter, it's just the units of density. So, that means, I would like to find out what is the mass of the particular species in unit volume. The unit volume here refers to the volume of the gas mixture. Okay. So, if I am taking one uh, cubic meter of the gas volume, what is the amount of a particular species of gas, what is the amount in kilograms which is present in that particular sample. But in practice as you saw earlier, we were talking about ppm and ppb levels, the amount of the gas present will be very small. So, usually we use microgram per meter cube as the appropriate unit. So, if I am going to represent either on the volume basis or on the mass basis, I can convert from one to the other and it is very easy to do that. So, I will just give the formula it is based on ideal gas relation. And if I am given in a parts per in a mass basis to convert it to ppm volume basis, I will have to just to take the value of the mass density in milligrams per cubic meter instead of microgram. I am using milligram here, but of course, you can always add one more uh, factor. So, 273.15 plus T in degree centigrade because it depends on the temperature and divided by 12.187 times the molecular weight. So, the temperature is the temperature of the gas sample which is 
the reason why the temperature occurs is because the volume of the gas is to be measured at the temperature which is being specified and at that temperature the volume depends on the, the, the volume depends on the temperature according to the ideal gas law. And of course, we are assuming that the pressure is 1 bar. If the pressure is not 1 bar that can also be corrected by appropriately taking into account because the linear function of pressure. And uh, the molecular weight is the molecular weight of the species. So, we need to know the molecular weight and then we all we have to do is to substitute here and we will be able to get the appropriate value. Let me take an example. For example, if I have N O 2 and the concentration is given as 20 milligram per meter cube, I would like to find out what is the, this is the mass basis. So, volume basis all I have to do is to use that formula which I gave you just now. This will be 20 multiplied by the temperature. If I am assuming the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, this will be 273.15 plus 25 and this is nothing but your temperature in Kelvin. So, I am just converting the temperature in degree Celsius to degree in Kelvin divided by that factor 12.187. Multiply the molecular weight is known as 46, known to be 46.01. This is the m for n O2, and uh, this will work out to 10.6. So the volume basis it is 10 ppm level. The mass basis is about 20 milligram per meter cube. So if you are instead of a milligram, if you want to put it as microgram, you have to multiply by thousand. So, it will be 20,000 micrograms per meter cube. It is a rather high level of pollutant concentration. Of course, you can always, you can also convert it in the other fashion, the from ppm to ppm to you can convert to micro milligrams or micrograms per meter cube and the same formula can be used for that purpose. And let us look at the mass concentration of various species, if uh, 1 ppm of the particular species is present in the atmosphere, which is uh, at a total pressure of uh, 1 bar or 1 standard atmosphere and uh, the, one, the concentration is going to be 1 microgram per meter cube, you see that the amount of uh, ppm for different species is specified here. For carbon monoxide it corresponds to 1145, 1145 nitric oxide it comes to 1230, nitrogen dioxide this is NO2 1880, ozone 1962, sulphur dioxide 220. So, you see the 1 microgram per meter cube a small amount being present, the parts per million is quite large as you can see here. And uh, these are the units which are normally used in practice. Now, let us look at what are the various ways of uh, making the measurement of gas concentration. As I said earlier, there are two ways of doing it. One is the separation method, the other one is non-separation. Before we go into that, let us look at what could be the types of measurement which could give the gas concentration. So, I have a, an absorption spectrum of a mixture of gases. So, the absorption spectrum is actually obtained. In this case, let, let me explain the terms which are used here. It is very important to understand. This 100 ppm is the 100 parts per million of the gas the the various gases are present in the total atmosphere and 100 ppm meters means it is the product of the concentration times the path length okay so how do you take an absorption spectrum you pass an infrared beam through a certain thickness of the medium and that stands for this meters 100 ppm meters can be obtained by have 1 ppm over 100 meter length or 10 ppm over uh, 10 meter length or 100 ppm over 1 meter length. So, it can be this can be obtained by adjusting the concentration times the path length product to 100 ppm meters. So, you can either have very high concentration or short path length because they are all equivalent. 
because when uh, the, the infrared beam passes through this uh, gas, it gets absorbed. The absorption is selective and uh, it is depends on two factors, one the wavelength and the other one is the absorption coefficient of the particular species which is present and different gases are going to absorb in different parts of the spectrum. So, if you look at this, the screen here, you see that the different uh, species for example, C O 2 is here and uh, C O is here uh, not very far from it. So, C O absorbs in this band, C O 2 absorbs in this band, but if you look at propane and N hexane both of them have overlapping absorption. So, they have overlapping absorption. In fact, if I show other gases like water vapor and uh, nitrogen oxides and so on, they will also show some uh, overlap with other species. So, this overlap how we are going to take care of uh, later, we will look at it. And uh, you see the wavelength uh, starts from 3 micrometers, this is the wavelength of the radiation which is passing through the particular specimen or the, uh, the sample through which the measurement was taken. So, it is from 3 microns to 5 microns, this is the mid infrared range, the mid infrared range and uh, the scales are different for not for other than C O 2 the this scale is uh, valid and for C O 2 this is valid. Therefore, the C O 2 has much more absorption than the other species as you can see here, but what we are going to notice here is that there is a specific wavelength at which the particular species will absorb and it will not absorb at other frequencies other wavelengths. So, that is that gives me one way of doing the, the measurement of gas by using the appropriate infrared radiation of appropriate wavelength, I will be able to select the particular gas which is going to absorb all other gases will be inactive that means, that they are not going to absorb I am going to select. So, the separation is not physical it is separation is done by the wavelength. So, the wavelength will separate the species it will appear as though for that particular wavelength the other species do not exist. That means, that it is non separation, non separation technique as far as physical separation is concerned, but it is separated because of the wavelength different wavelengths are absorbed or radiation at different wavelengths are absorbed by different species and therefore, if I am interested in C O 2 I will use a appropriate wavelength and it will be absorbed only by C O 2 other gases will not absorb. Therefore, the whatever absorption I get is related to the presence of the C O 2 in the mixture. So, the separation is done by the absorption technique which is wavelength specific and not physical. So, the ultimately we are going to separate out the species, but not physically, but in the wavelength wise. In fact, I have taken this particular uh, uh, sketch from the, uh, the particular uh, spectrum from this particular wave the website and uh, there are more details can be found there. So, the what is the use of this particular uh, 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 sketch I have given? The use is to demonstrate that we can do the separation by looking at the spectra using the appropriate wavelength I can do that. There is one way of looking at this. Another way is, is it possible that I can do the same thing by a different technique? What do I mean by that? Suppose, I want to use the wavelength specific uh, radiation, I have to have a spectrometer or I have to have a source which will emit only in this particular radiation uh, in this uh, uh, re region for example, if it is CO 2 if it is CO it has to do only in this region. That means, I must find a source which is going to be emitting radiation only in that particular wavelength of interest. So, that I can do that, that can be done in a spectrometer. In a spectrometer what we have is a broadband source or a source which will radiate all over the wavelength scale, but by using the spectrometer we are going to divide the light into its spectral components by some suitable means. For example, I can use a prism, I can use a grating and uh, associated optics, so that I can uh, get whatever wavelength I want I can get from the instrument or I can also use what is called a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, which will uh, do the separation in a time scale uh, in the in the, uh, the separation will, uh, will be done over time, I, I will come back to that a little later. So, one way is to use a spectrometer. The second way is to is to use what is the, the spectrometer because we are going to separating out the the wavelengths uh, into the spectrum of wavelengths. It is called dispersive instrument. So a spectrometer is a dispersive instrument because the light is separated into its wavelength components. 
in the non dispersive measurement I am not going to separate the light also, I am not going to separate this, but by clever arrangement I will be able to use the non NDIR or the non, non dispersive instrument to actually measure the presence of the gas by a simple technique. Let us look at the principle which is going to be used in that particular case. So, I use what is called an acousto optic detector that is the heart of the matter and the acousto optic cell consists of a small cylindrical vessel with a transparent window through which the infrared beam can pass into the cell and the acousto optic cell is a volume of gas and the gas which is contained inside is a such that it will absorb the radiation which we want it to absorb. For example, if you fill this with carbon dioxide, it will absorb only the radiation which is absorbable by the carbon dioxide and the rest will not be absorbed. Okay. And what happens if uh, radiation absorbed by this uh, gas inside, the gas temperature pressure temperature will go up because it absorbs radiation. When the temperature goes up, the pressure will try to will uh, tend to increase. Suppose I have a radiation which is uh, chopped using a wheel with a window. Whenever the window comes in front of the IR source, the radiation will pass through to the acoustic cell. Whenever the window is not there, but the wheel is there, there will be no radiation coming here. So, if you look at the pressure which is monitored by the output of this uh, whatever is shown here, this is a pressure transducer. We have already looked at pressure transducer earlier, it could be a capacitor for example. So, the capacitance changes and that will give you a signal electrical signal. So, when the light is passing into the acoustic opt optic cell, the pressure goes up, slowly it builds up and then it uh, reaches a maximum value and uh, as long as the wheel, as long as the this aperture here, there is a hole here, the hole is going to come in and leave during this process it is going to be illuminated and the pressure remains at this value. When once the wheel is the hole has passed the source, the, star, the pressure starts decreasing because there is no radiation communicated here. So, the pressure comes down and again this repeats itself because I am rotating this wheel by using an electric motor and the IR source I am going to get a collimated beam here and that passes through this hole and I can get a an output from the this con, this uh, uh, transducer, I can get an output which is going to vary as shown here. So, this is the pressure versus time signal which you get from the acousto optic cell. In other words, acousto optic detector is a detector which detects the radiation of particular wavelength of interest to us. For example, if I want carbon dioxide, I fill it uh, the wavelength corresponding to this, uh, this region, I use carbon dioxide inside the cell. If I want carbon monoxide, I use carbon monoxide in the cell. And if uh, some other gas is required, so the gas the gas contained in the acoustic optic cell is the gas which I am going to detect. So acoustic optic the cell is also an acoustic optic detector for a particular gas species. Okay, so that is a very important thing to notice. So now what is the use of this? So if I have the following, if I keep in terms of the in front of the acoustic optic cell if I keep a sample cell where I am going to allow the gas sample to go in and out, this is the sample in which I want to find out whether there is carbon dioxide or whatever species I am interested in. So, what happens if you put the sample cell here, the, ga the gas of interest to us which is inside in this uh, cell absorbs some of the radiation and therefore, the radiation received by the acoustic optic detector is reduced because it transmits less than 100 percent of what is going to fall on the sample cell. Therefore, it is reduced and therefore, the amount absorbed by the gas which is present here of the particular species which I am interested in. So, suppose I want to measure carbon dioxide in the sample cell. So, this is for this uh, some carbon dioxide is here. There is also some carbon dioxide in this cell and this will absorb whatever is not already absorbed by the sample in the sample cell. Therefore, the output of this uh, acoustic detector will be smaller. You can see that this was the output when there is no gas sample cell or there is no carbon dioxide in this particular cell. If there is carbon dioxide present here, this signal will go down. So, this uh, 
difference between the signal from the this value to this value that is due to absorption in the sample cell. So, the sample cell we can find out what is the concentration of the gas in the sample cell by for example, I can do the following I can fill the sample cell with the different concentration known concentration of carbon dioxide and then I can find out what is the reduction in the in the signal and then I can calibrate it. Therefore, I can take standard samples of carbon dioxide of various concentration or mixture containing a certain proportion of carbon dioxide and I can do this experiment and once for all calibrate the instrument. So, let us look at the thing again. So, without sample with sample there is a change in the output of the acoustic optic detector and what do you notice? You notice that I am using the light coming from the source without any without converting it to any spectrum. I am using all the light which is coming out. The selective absorption is done by the detector itself. Detector itself is a selective absorber. So, it absorbs only the wavelength of interest to us and the sample cell if it contains the same absorber this carbon dioxide uh, acoustic optic detector will sense carbon dioxide present in the sample cell. So, now let us look at how the NDIR gas analyzer is actually constructed. So, it consists usually of two sources IR source 1 and IR source 2 we use a reference cell we use a sample cell we also use what is called a filter cell. So, the filter cell is an important part of the thing. If you remember when we talked about absorption we said several for example, this is this is characteristic of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide and so Suppose you take a look at these two propane and hexane both are going to absorb in the same region, but uh, to different extent there may be some overlap some region where both will uh, absorb in some region only one will absorb. So, what I can think of is the following suppose I put a filter cell filter cell in front of the sample cell which contains a large concentration of NXN. For example, propane and NXN I want to uh, differentiate or I want to measure the presence of propane when hexane is also present all I have to do is to use a filter cell with a large concentration of this. So, that whatever absorption can take place with the hexane will be totally absorbed in the filter cell. So, the filter cell will remove all the radiation which is absorbable by one or the other of the interfering gases and therefore, what is incident on the sample cell is only the radiation which is not absorbed by the absorbed both by both the gases. So, that is how your filter cell is created made the filter cell will consist of a the a large concentration of the gas which is going to interfere with the particular species which in which we are interested in. So, let us see how this uh, NDIR gas analyzer works. So, the first IR source one it passes through the filter cell then through the sample cell and there is a front surface mirror. So, that the the radiation is allowed to fall on an acoustic optic detector this is the acoustic optic detector with a diaphragm in between and there is a condenser microphone and now on the other side the reference cell the reference cell does not contain the gas we are interested in therefore, the full intensity is felt here. So, the difference between the the pressure developed on this side and this side is the actual the output though that pressure difference it is like you remember in the previous case I said with and without sample with sample and without sample. So, without sample and with sample is not done separately twice it is done in the same instrument this is without sample with sample. So, you have a dual beam NDIR gas analyzer that means, two beams of IR source which are of course, matched perfectly. So, that they are equal intensity and so on. So, the diaphragm is going to be the communicator between the two parts of the acoustic detector this will this diaphragm will deflect and the deflection of the diaphragm is going to be measured by the electrical output of course, the entire thing works with a chopper wheel which is chopping the radiation in the AC mode or alternate current mode alternate current mode. So, the condenser output is also an alternating current or alternate alternating voltage output. So, the the magnitude of the voltage output is directly related to the the concentration of the particular gas which I am interested in. So, India gas gas analyzer is very popular it is used for measurement of uh, uh, combustion gases in most uh, in the IC engine laboratories we have a NDIR which uh, 
is used for CO, CO2 and uh, monitoring these concentration of various species. But you will also notice that the, in the case of acoustic optic detector, you require different detectors with different gases being present, so that they can uh, measure the concentration of different gases. So, one detector will not work for all of them, you need uh, two or three different, deta different detectors, so that you can measure the species of different gases if they are present in at the same time. So, that is the first uh, example I have taken, the NDIR. NDIR is very popular, it is available in uh, commercially and uh, it can be set up in any laboratory for making measurements. So, the second uh, system I am going to look at is the remote sensing. So, the schematic of a differential absorption laser system is shown here. Before I discuss this uh, schematic, let me just look at the the basic ideas. So, I am going to look at the basic idea of the differential absorption system. What is this differential absorption? So, let us look at the following. <coughs> You, you remember we showed the spectrum, the spectrum consists of the following for any gas <coughs> something like that we had. This is a broad band <coughs> for a particular gas. For example, I may be talking about CO2, CO, N2O, NO etcetera, but if you if you if you take this and enlarge it is also a low resolution spectrum. So, if I enlarge that means I am going to take a high resolution it will show something like this. In fact, if you go back to the figure there, you can almost see the, if you can see here, you see the, those are all lines here. There are a lot of lines uh, close to each other and if you enlarge it further, that is what I did just now, <coughs> that is what I got. So, this has got a large number of lines close to each other. So, what do we notice? We notice that if you look at the height of this, the height represents the the amount of absorption or in this case the emission, it does not matter which they are going to be uh, mirror images in the same. Therefore, at this wavelength corresponding to the peak, it absorbs or emits radiation. Okay. And if you go here in the valley, very little of absorption or emission is going to take place. So, I can identify if I have an absorption band or emission band something like this, this is the highly absorbing highly absorbing and no absorption or very little. Okay. And uh, this uh, difference here, I will say is delta lambda, it is very small compared to lambda a very small difference. The wavelength difference between the peak and the valley, this is the peak and this is called a valley, it is very narrow. So, if I have radiation falling on this gas at the wavelength corresponding to the peak, it will be absorbed very, very highly absorbed 
and if the wavelength of the radiation is just a little bit away from that and it is in the valley, it is not going to be absorbed at all. So, differential absorption means choose two wavelengths close to each other, one in the one at the peak which I will call it as lambda on each other lambda on close to the peak is the peak and the other one I will call it a lambda off this is called the valley. So, it is a very interesting technique. So, what I am going to do is I am going to use two beams of light and in this case I am going to use lasers which are very close to each other in wavelength that means that lambda on and lambda off are very close to each other. The reason why they should be very close to each other will become clear when we go into more details which we will do in a little while from now. So, the point is that if the path through the gas is covered by two beams of radiation which are identical in every respect excepting that one has a wavelength equal to lambda on the other one is going to have a wavelength equal to lambda off these two are going to undergo different amounts of absorption and that is why it is called differential absorption. One is absorbed highly the other one is not at all absorbed and therefore, by measuring the ratio of these two or the difference between these two we will be able to find out how much of the species is present in the atmosphere. So, this is just the broad broad outline of the method and let us look at the some little bit of uh, how it is going to be actually done. So, I have got a laser source. So, it will have lambda on and lambda off both and it is going to be leaving the laser it will going to go and uh, in the atmosphere I may have some clouds for example. So, they will reflect the light. So, lambda on and lambda off both are going to be reflected and I will find out when they come back here I will find out I have a detector here. So, this is the intervening atmosphere which is full of the gas of our interest. For example, I may be interested in finding out how much of moisture is present in the air, how much of the gas, how much of the atmosphere, how, how much of uh, water vapor for example, H 2 O. Of course, in this case when you want to measure the H 2 O concentration, it is a useful gas because we want water, it is not a pollutant, it is actually a useful thing. So, I want to find out how much water vapor is present in the atmosphere, entering in the atmosphere by measuring, by I will choose the two wavelengths such that one of them is highly absorbed the other one is not absorbed and the second point if these two frequencies are very close to each other the other properties for example, scattering. What is scattering because of the particles present in the atmosphere they may be due to various reasons we are not going into all those uh, details the radiation will be scattered and also when the laser beam goes all the way from the source and gets reflected from the clouds there are lot of attenuation because of the beam uh, divergence then scattering out and so on. So, the scattering and other processes like beam broadening and so on are common to both because scattering is very highly sensitive to wavelength but because the two wavelengths are very very close to each other we will take an a actual example you will see how close they are then it practically there is no change in the lambda. The lambda is a, I am talking about very small de delta lambda lambda on minus lambda off if I do that it will be very very small compared to lambda that is what we are talking about. 
this lambda is nothing but the average of the two values. Therefore, because the lambdas are very close to each other, the scattering and other beam spoiling processes are common and therefore, the only difference between the two will be the differential absorption. So, the only thing which is different is the differential absorption because lambda on is absorbed highly and lambda off is not at all absorbed. Therefore, if I look at the difference between the two signals which I am going to get, I will be able to find out the concentration of the particular species. And uh, before I just close, I will just give one exam, one expression which will be useful, this is called Beer's law, which is valid for small concentration, which is what we usually expect in the atmosphere we are talking about parts per million and so on. So, if a, if a radiation leaves a point and goes through an absorber and comes out, if this length is L, if the intensity is I naught, the I at L. So, we have I L by I naught is e to the power of minus the concentration of the species multiplied by what is called the absorption cross section multiplied with path length. So, this is the concentration that is number per meter cube, this absorption cross section is given in meter squared and the length is in meter path length in meters. So, in the next uh, lecture, we will get back to this particular equation and we will see how this is used for measuring remotely or sense, sense remotely the concentration of species in the interway atmosphere. Thank you.